right, well, in the interest of time, um, we always like to be respectful of everyone's time. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, here we've got just a few kind of preliminary uh, remarks before we kind of get into the meat of the session. Um, and again, thank you guys for joining us so much. Uh, I am Kira Duke with the Teaching with Primary Sources program um, at MTSU. And um, I have uh, with me today uh, part of our team here. We've got Dr. Stacy Graham um, and Layla Smallwood, who is our graduate research assistant um, and also helps Lisa Oakley over in East Tennessee at the Historical Society there. So the three of us will be, uh, you know, available for any questions you might have. So you can drop those in the chat box and we'll be happy to answer those throughout the session. So the sessions this week um, are really focused more on um, you know, our Teaching with Primary Sources program and really helping you guys to think about some activities, some ways to approach um, student, helping students as they build uh, those historical thinking skills and their research skills as they are doing History Day projects. So today we're going to be focusing on looking at evaluating sources in some different ways uh, of breaking that down uh, for things that show up in the, uh, the, the judging rubric. Um, and then tomorrow, um, Stacy's gonna talk to us some about student voice and historical argument. And so that'll be the focus for tomorrow. Um, we're also gonna talk a little bit today about some tips for using the Library of Congress digital collections and some things that can help your students there as they're trying to find primary sources for their projects. But before we get into that, I just wanna go through a, quick, a couple quick housekeeping things. Um, so first, if you would remember just to keep your mics muted um, throughout the bulk of the presentations, we are going to do a couple of breakout rooms during um, this session today. So when we do those, you can um, you know, unmute yourself. And of course, uh, we encourage conversation um, during those breakout rooms. Um, but we do want the sessions to be interactive. So again, if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the chat box um, throughout the session, and we will be happy to respond to questions, comments, um, all those kind of things. And if you would, if you haven't already done so, uh, please be sure to rename yourself, um, and it just helps us as we kind of track attendance. And then as we respond to things in the chat box, that'll be helpful. And um, we do have, of course, have a Padlet. If you haven't had a chance to visit this yet, uh, Nikki put up a bunch of great stuff from last week's sessions, and we've started adding some materials that we'll be using for this week's sessions there. You can also find the recordings for these sessions. So if you want to go back and reference something later on, those are included there on that Padlet page as well. All right. So wait, we'll come back to that at the end. Let me... Stop sharing this for just a second. So to kick us off today, uh, it's actually going to be uh, Layla Smallwood, and she's going to be talking to us a little bit about some different ways of approaching analysis. So I'm going to turn things over to Layla. Thanks. I was trying to get that Padlet link in the chat box. Um, thank you, Nikki. Beat me to it. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay. Awesome. So as we're going through, if you have questions or comments, make sure you put those in the chat box so we can um, address those and answer things. Um, so today we are going to be kicking off with um, our identifying perspective piece. Um, so how many of y'all have used a hippo organizer report? If you have, just put like a yes in the chat box or give me a thumbs up. Cool, cool. Okay, so some of y'all have. Awesome. It's available on our website. Um, Today, we are going to be using both a happy and a hippo. Has anybody used a happy organizer? John, I know you have. John used it last week. Okay, Stacy has. Great. So we're going to be using these two different organizers, kind of working through them. The happy is not available on our website yet, but it's available online if you just do a Google search. We're just working on formatting it and tailoring it to what our teachers need as they're looking at it. So today we are going to be looking at, um, so excerpts from What to the Slave is the 4th of July. So Frederick Douglass's speech. We're going to be looking at a few excerpts from that in breakout rooms. And some of y'all will be looking at it using a happy organizer. And some of y'all will be looking at it using the hippo organizer. So depending on which group you're in is going to be the organizer that you use. So we are going to look at this speech and analyze it with our organizers. I'm just going to share my screen for a second. Okay, so here's the happy. This is all available on the Padlet, the happy organizer and the hippo. And then the transcript for those excerpts are also available on the Padlet here. So if you're looking for that, it's just right here on this July 13th um, column. So what we're going to be doing is looking at this speech and looking at the historical context from these excerpts, 
who is Douglas talking to? What's his purpose? And really digging into his perspective. What's his point of view in giving this speech? What do these excerpts tell us? And we're going to do more with this speech later today, um, but we're just going to kick off. Awesome. So we're going to talk about uh, this document and these organizers um, just for the next 10 ish minutes. Um, and I really want y'all to communicate with me in the chat box since we do have over 30 people. That way we're not trying to talk over each other. Um, so let's kind of get started um, breaking it down. The hippo and the happy are very similar in the beginning. You're looking at historical context. So let's talk about the historical context of this document. In the chat box, can y'all give me a little bit of that historical background? Okay, pre emancipation, 1852. Good. What do we know about that time period? 1852 during slavery. Good. What's happening during this time or what's about to happen? Abolitionist movement. Good. On the rise. Heightened sectionalism. I love using the term sectionalism to describe this time period. Um, good. Rising violence. Okay. It's in Rochester, New York. Good. Um, let's see, Bleeding Kansas. Yes, I wrote that on my notes, actually. Bleeding, Bleeding Kansas, the Kansas-Nebraska Act are going to happen in about two to three years, right? So we have those tensions building. Bleeding Kansas, I think, is in 1855, so just a few years, right? They're celebrating independence, right? So we are almost to the centennial, right? We're almost there. Um, so this is 1852. Good. He's speaking on July 5th. I don't think he gives this on the 4th. I think he gives it on the 5th, this speech. Okay, so let's think for a minute. We said all of these different pieces are happening together at the same time when Douglas is giving this speech. We have these events leading up to the Civil War. It's pre-abolition. We have rising sectionalism. We have violence. We have this split depending on which states are going to have enslaved people versus which states are going to be free. So we have these issues happening. And let's give some context for Frederick Douglass. Talk, talk to me a bit about Frederick Douglass. Good. What do we know about Frederick Douglass? Yes, he is a former slave. Um, he is self-emancipated. He ran away. Formerly enslaved man who became a great orator. He's self-taught. He's very well educated and well respected, right? So some context there surrounding Frederick Douglass's life. Leading voice of the abolition movement. Good. So Frederick Douglass is well known. He's been asked to speak here in 1852. Um, he is, again, the, the voice of this movement, one of the leading voices of the abolition movement during this time period in the 1850s. Okay. So on the happy and the hippo, our next pieces, they're the same again. We have that audience or intended audience. Who is Douglas speaking to? Good, white Americans, what else? Good, good. So who is this intended audience in this speech? Think about who's gonna listen to Douglas speaking in abolitionist society, good. We're not gonna have these, um, at the time, these Southern Democrats coming up and listening to, or Northern Democrats probably listening to Frederick Douglass's speech, right? They're, they're not gonna be attending. Um, it's going to be your, your, those who are either abolitionist or leaning abolitionist, right? So maybe those on the fence about slavery, good. So he is speaking to people who respect him, want to hear him speak. Um, it's not going to be a crowd of enslavers, more than likely, right? Good. Okay. How does his audience affect his subject matter? How does he tailor his speech to his audience? How does that kind of Help us understand more of his perspective. How does the fact that Douglas is speaking to a white, probably abolitionist or leaning abolitionist audience, how does that affect what he's saying? Good, comparing contrasting experiences, good. They have an understanding of where he's coming from. He directly relates to the colonist struggle for independence from the oppressive tyrant, right? He's pulling on their, their like being, like they are free, right? He says Americans are celebrating this holiday 
and they are free from British oppression, right? And this holiday celebrates it. Well, not everybody can celebrate that, right? He's trying to light a fire underneath them. Like, you're free. Why aren't other people? Why do we still have people who are living in oppression? Yes, he's pointing out the hypocrisy. He clearly says that, right? He says, um, the hypocrisy of the nation must be exposed. He's not like sweetening words here. He is saying exactly, maybe not exactly what he thinks. He probably still is sweetening words to an extent, but he is getting to the heart and soul of this issue. Good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, so the point of view here. This is important, and for your students to understand this point of view too. What is Douglas's point of view? We have some background on Douglas. Some of y'all shared that. What is Frederick Douglass's point of view here? He's the author. He's the speaker here. What's his point of view? He's pointing out how this freedom does to everyone. Former slave with firsthand experience. Good. He is a formerly enslaved man. He has lived in enslavement. He, and not only that, but he is a black man in America in 1852, right? So now, even if he's not enslaved anymore, he is having that oppression, right? He's still oppressed. He doesn't have the freedoms that the people that he's speaking to probably do at this point. Good. He's saying slavery should be abolished. The 4th of July cannot be celebrated by all because liberty does not apply to all. Good. I think the key is he refers to fellow citizens at a time when black Americans, free or not, are not largely included in this designation. That's a good point because Dred Scott actually, so the case Dred Scott is actually, they say he's free and then they overturn that decision in 1852 and say, sorry, he's actually enslaved. And then the case goes all the way back up through the court. So this is a key time period for that too. They are saying fellow citizens and he's, you know, playing on this, this, this term because it speaks to our founding documents, right? But if you're looking at it from the Dred Scott decision, right, that we'll get into in a few years, Frederick Douglass, this fantastic orator standing in front of us, would not have been considered a citizen. So you have to look at it from that perspective as well. Good. Okay. The purpose. And some of y'all got into this as well when you were talking about point of view and intended audience. What is his purpose in this? And the happy and the hippo are kind of flipped there. Their peas are a little backwards, but we're going to hit both of them. So what is Douglas's purpose? To inform America of its hypocrisy, injustices, and crimes done against God and man. Yes, to point out that while you may be free, others are not, right? To call attention to the suffering that's happening while you were celebrating this 4th of July. Good. Good. It's not a holiday to enslaved people. Good. Good. Highlighting the commonality between the two groups. Yes. You fought for a freedom. You were oppressed. Now we are oppressed. Why do we not have the same opportunities? Why do we not have the same opportunities to fight for freedom? To argue that change is needed, right? He is trying to, like Kira said earlier, light a fire underneath them, appeal to their emotions. He's trying to engage with them. He's trying to inform them. And he's trying to persuade them as to why he is just, to inform and persuade as to why he is just as much a citizen as the people in that audience are. Good. Good, Julie, good. Okay, and so our why on the happy is significance. That is your so what, right? And if you're doing a DBQ, this happy, I think, was created initially for a DBQ. So how and why did this document support your thesis may not go with what we're doing today, but what is the so what here? Why is this document, why are these excerpts, why is this speech that Douglas is giving in 1852 to a group of white people in New York, why is it important? What's the so what here? Good, Eric. To show the plight of enslaved or formerly enslaved could not be celebrated because they were not free. Good. Slavery is practiced in the Americas for century leading up to the point of the speech. And yeah, the last the lasting effects can be seen today. Good. Good. He's saying let's do something about it, right? This has to be solved. This right has to be wronged. We cannot continue to sit here and celebrate while other people are in bondage, while I continue to mourn, while my people continue to mourn. That's where Douglas is going with this. It shows the lack of freedom for enslaved. Good. The lack of citizenship, right? They are not even considered citizens at this point, not just enslaved people, but Black people in general are not going to be considered citizens at this point. 
Good. And so on the hippo, you have this outside information. We're going to jump back to the hippo for a second. Outside information and organization. Um, what specific factual information comes to mind when you read this document, right? So this is where we pull in maybe documents that we know have happened or events that we know have happened, like that historical context piece um, and the pieces that will happen, right? The pieces that like the Emancipation Proclamation, like the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, um, those pieces that will happen. So we have that outside information and can look backwards and see how not only this speech was influenced by previous events, but how it influenced future events. Good. 1848 Seneca Falls. Good. And that's actually part of this lesson plan that I pulled this from. <laughs> Good job, Julie. All right. So when you are looking at these two documents, and the happy will be up on our site soon, um, these are just a good way for students to get into the, really dig into the document and to understand not only the point of view, but the perspective that this person is coming from. Why are they, why did he write this speech? You know, what, who is he talking to? Why is he talking to these people? To really get into identifying the writer, the speaker, their perspectives, as well as who they're trying to speak to, who they're trying to reach. Um, so that, I guess, is the end of my activity. Um, thank you all for kind of jumping in and doing this really quickly with me and being super um, super awesome participants in the chat box. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Kira. Thank you, Layla. So that's a great segue into what I am going to um, kind of dig into with here, uh, here with you, and that is understanding historical significance. Uh, let me get to the right slide here. So I think when students are asked about why things are significant, they have a real hard time kind of wrapping their minds around uh, what, um, what that means. Um, so what uh, I wanted to do here is kind of break down first uh, kind of a definition of what historical significance is. And then maybe uh, give you guys some examples of how you can uh, begin to construct some activities that will help students to kind of understand historical significance so that when they're doing history of projects or whether they're just doing, you know, any type of research project in their class, um, they can uh, really begin to grasp what the skill set means. So what is historical significance? So I, I got this definition from the Historical Thinking Project, um, and their definition uh, was significance depends on one's perspective and purpose. Uh, a historical person or event can acquire significance if we, the historians, can link it to larger trends and stories that reveal something of importance for us today. So what does that mean? Um, a lot of this and a lot of things, you know, when we're doing history, it really boils down to the questions that we're asking. Um, and so when we think about historical significance, a lot of what's going to determine that is going to be what questions the historian uh, or the person doing the research is asking. Um, and so that is going to shape, of course, their perspective and their purpose as they are looking at different source material. So let's kind of put that into action and see what that looks like. So we're going to look at a couple of different sources and we're going to think about a research question and think about just how significant these sources are when we relate those to that particular question. So our first example um, is this one. And let me see, I pulled up the, oh, if I can open the chat box here. I'm going to share with you guys, this is a direct link for this. So in case you have trouble um, seeing uh, the text here, you have that link that you can open it up if you want to kind of follow along. And I'm going to read just a couple like uh, pieces of this. So this is from an oral history. It's from Thomas McIntyre, who is a former slave, um, who is 90 years old at the time that this was collected. Um, and he starts with talking about, uh, you know, when he was born. So he says he was born in Bath County, Kentucky, January 17th, 1847. My father was Bryant McIntyre and my mother was Sally McIntyre. Father was taken by slave traders from Africa, um, and they brought him to Norfolk, Virginia, and put him on the block and sold him to Jim Lane of Bath County, Kentucky. Lane made the first cooking stove man, made the first cooking stove manufactured in the United States west of New York, um, and it was made at Ashland, Kentucky, as it was burned wood. Um, oh wait, um, and Lane. Uh, Let's see here. Trying to. And so basically, the lame people that owned his mother were friends, and betwixt them, uh, 
his father and mother were ordered uh, so they could be man and wife. So basically they could be married. So you see in them days, um, you know, all it was given was an order or written for a man and a woman to be married. And so he goes on and talks about, you know, again, his mother's father. And then he talks about, uh, you know, the children that they had. And he goes back to talking about Jim Lane, who said he owned uh, 550 slaves um, and about 2,000 acres of land. Um, he was a very rich man in those days, and I reckon uh, he's the same now. He had a big red brick house with 24 rooms. Um, and then he goes on to talk about the slave quarters in the final paragraph there, where he says that they were about 300 yards from the big house, and every family had their own cabin and eight acres of land for themselves. Um, and they had a vegetable and a garden truck if they needed them. Uh, so they raised their own chickens and turkeys and hogs and cattle were butchered and shared amongst all the families. So this source. Now, if we're looking at the question of, um, if, you know, if we're looking at kind of what the national debate over slavery is prior to the Civil War, how significant is this source? So if our question is, you know, prior to the Civil War and looking at the national debate over slavery, um, yeah, how significant is this source? So if you're in the chat box, you guys want to put some thoughts there. So for researching the national debate over slavery prior to the Civil War. All right, so all right, does show firsthand experience, highlights his lack of freedom. All right, so Sean, yeah, the personal quality of the narrative um, is makes it very limited in use, right? Because he's talking about, you know, really just his experience and not so much getting into the national debate. Someone mentioned that, you know, uh, you know, his experience seemed kind of counter to, you know, what we think of as the average experience of an enslaved person. It does give details that, you know, can be hard to find in other types of records. So yeah, so many of you have kind of noted again, kind of the personal nature, right? So it's really kind of, you know, him talking about the experiences of his family. Um, you know, it's it's kind of gathered over, uh, you know, a long period of time. So it's kind of him sharing uh, memories from, you know, his family, uh, but maybe not his own firsthand memories uh, as much. Um, so we run into the kind of the problematic nature of sometimes of oral histories. So yeah, so all good points. So again, I want you guys to remember this one. So what we are going to look at next is an excerpt from the Dred Scott case. So this one is, uh, of course, the Dred Scott case is 1857. Um, and in this one, we know, of course, uh, you know, the question of whether or not uh, Scott was able to sue for his freedom um, after his enslaver had taken him into free territory and then brought him back into a slave state. So um, the excerpt here, upon these considerations, it is the opinion of the court that the act of Congress, which prohibited a citizen, citizen from holding and owning property of this kind in the territory of the United States, north of the line therein mentioned, is not warranted by the Constitution, and is therefore void, that neither Dred Scott himself nor any of his family were made free by being carried into this territory, even if they had been carried there by the owner with the intention of becoming a permanent resident. It is the judgment of this court that it appears by the record before us that the plaintiff in error is not a citizen of Missouri, and in the sense in which the word is used in the Constitution, and that the Circuit Court of the United States had no jurisdiction in this case and could give no judgment in it. So basically, this is, uh, you know, Dred Scott is saying that African Americans, uh, you know, there's no way that they can actually be citizens, um, and it really kind of sets back the abolitionist movement. Um, is, a, is a huge uh, defeat for the abolitionist movement as they have been trying to uh, move this case forward. 
So again, if our question is looking at the national debate over slavery prior to the Civil War, how significant is this document? Right, so it's applicable nationwide. So that gets into like, again, that big, the scope, right? Um, right, this one is hugely significant. You honestly can't talk about the national debate over slavery prior to the war and not hit on Dred Scott. Yeah, and it also makes that slavery is no longer just a Southern issue um, and can no longer be limited to just the states that, um, you know, had, uh, you know, had been slave states before, but now it's saying, you know, with this essentially that, you know, someone who owns slaves in a Southern state uh, can take those slaves with them anywhere in the country and basically this extends the reach of slavery across the nation. Uh, which is huge as we get into yeah, expansion, westward expansion. This is huge as we think about that um, and what that was doing with kind of the crisis that the nation was moving towards. So again, thinking about these two sources and again, thinking about historical significance, again, if we're looking at this national debate, we can see that the first source, while has a lot of great information, is nowhere near as historically significant for our research question as the second source. And so sometimes, again, showing students sources like this and giving them that question, having them break that down can really kind of help them to understand that. So that doesn't mean, though, that the, our previous source didn't have any historical value, because of course it does. But then if we were to change our question and change our research question, then that source could become much of much more value than the Dred Scott decision. So what we're going to do um, in breakout rooms um, is we are going to look at uh, a third source. And it's actually the one that we just looked at in our previous group. It's going to be the Douglas speech again. Um, so you guys will have another source to read. But I want you to think about these three sources. And I want you to think about, uh, again, if we're researching kind of the national debate over slavery, kind of how you might use these three sources um, and what questions you could pose that would center these sources um, as kind of the most significant for answering the historical questions that you might be researching. So again, we're going to put you guys into groups. I'm going to have Nikki do that in just a second. So again, you can go back and uh, pull up the, uh, the Frederick Douglass speech that we had just a minute ago. And again, the questions we're going to look at, I want you to discuss the significance of the Frederick Douglass speech related to our research question. So again, national debate over slavery prior to the Civil War. And then um, once you kind of discussed its overall significance in that, kind of compared it to the other two, I want you to think about how you might help your students to understand significance, how you might be able to take this kernel of an idea and really structure some activities and some examples around that to help your students. So Nikki, if you would put us into just five breakout rooms. Any questions while she's getting that set up? So again, there are those questions for you. And again, we can kind of pop in and out and help anyone if you guys are having trouble. So. All right, if everybody has the documents, um needed. I'm going to go ahead and send everybody. Everyone back over now. So I want to take just a second and kind of uh, give you guys a chance to maybe share out some things that come up in your breakout rooms. So when we think about, again, teaching historical significance, uh, you know, what are some additional supports that your students might need um, to understand significance? What are some things that we might need to add in to help our students as we are trying to teach them about historical significance? Yeah, context is huge. Uh, and you know that is depending on your grade level can be a, a, you know a really a challenge because you know our middle school kids oftentimes don't have a lot of context. Um, so that is definitely one that you want to help them with. 
Yeah, and graphic organizers can definitely um, help support that and help them to kind of organize information and help them, you know, we think about the two that Layla showed us earlier, um, and especially with that happy form, how it has some kind of questions broken down um, for each of those categories. And I think that can be really beneficial um, because students haven't built that muscle memory yet to know that when we're looking at a source, these are the questions that I should ask of each source. And so giving them a graphic organizer with those questions embedded in it um, can help them to kind of begin to build that muscle memory so that again, every time we're looking at a source, we know we should be asking this series of questions and that's gonna help us to kind of again, understand that source on a deeper level. Yeah, and then understanding the political, social, and cultural attitudes uh, attached to historical event um, and really kind of digging into, again, that bit of the context um, is going to be really important for them so that they can understand, um, you know, tone, they can understand some of the rhetoric that's used. Um, the other thing kind of more broadly culturally is, you know, a lot of these documents uh, bring in a lot of, you know, references to, you know, either classical things, uh, you know, that really are going to be outside of students' kind of, you know, realm of expertise or their realm of knowledge. And so helping them to kind of pinpoint some of that can be, uh, can be very beneficial. Yeah, and understanding legislation, you know, with the Dred Scott case also, you know, students need to be able to understand and decipher, you know, legal language um, to some extent. And that can be, uh, you know, a challenge in and of itself. Um, and then, yeah, short-term versus long-term significance. Um, that is really uh, important too. So again, uh, you know, there are some things that are, that's going to change depending on what kind of, again, how we're looking at them, their immediate impact versus kind of their long-term impacts. The other thing that is going to be important, of course, is students being able to ask good questions. Um, and so, you know, that might be uh, another skill set that you need to work on is helping students to begin to devise good research questions and then to work on the skill set of actually being able to revise those research questions as they go along so that, um, you know, they can continue to ask better questions, which is going to get them to a better thesis statement overall. So hopefully this is kind of give you guys some things to kind of ponder on, um, some ideas about how you might structure some activities with students. Um, and again, this PowerPoint, the sources uh, are there on the palette for your use. Um, but at this time, uh, let's see here, I am going to kind of switch gears a little bit. Um, and so we are going to think a little bit about the Library of Congress website um, and some things there that may be, um, you know, new to you or some things that you want to, you know, remember to point out to students so that as they're doing some of their research, um, they can make the most use out of this gigantic website. Um, so if you guys want to do kind of a, you know, want to raise your hand, uh, you know, or use a thumbs up, how many of you guys have students actually use the Library of Congress website when they are doing their History Day uh, research? And of course, I can't really see anyone. Um, so hopefully some of you guys are. So some things to note. Um, you want to be sure that students are aware, first off, that using the Library of Congress digital collections is not like searching Google. Um, so that is the, the biggest obstacle first is, again, just them wrapping their minds around that it is not the same thing. And I um, have always been a firm believer that before you really kind of put them uh, in front of a computer and, and give them, you know, you know, send them off to do some research in the Library of Congress, it's good to have them do a little, a little homework first. Um, so it's nice to have with you uh, basically a list of search terms, um, a list of, you know, maybe that's dates, maybe that's people, places, things like that that they want to look up so that, again, they have a place to get started. Because um, you can't just, I mean, well, you can't. So you could just say, I want to research the Civil War. And hopefully the library site is not going to be super slow for us right now. Um, but when we do this, of course, that's super broad. Um, and that's going to pull us up tens of thousands of items, which is just too much. So you want to be able to have students uh, understand. Oh, somebody popped up a. Sorry, I just did a real quick poll okay. while you were talking of right. uh, whether they did or not. 
All right. So, um, so yeah. So, let's see. Um, so yeah. So you're going to see that you're going to get, you know, three hundred and sixteen thousand items. Too much. Too much, right? So this is where it's important for students to kind of have narrowed that down. Is there a particular battle that they're interested in? Is there a particular person that they're interested in? Like, again, what element of the Civil War are they wanting to look at? Um, you know, is it more of a the social impacts of it? Is it more the political side of things? Is it that they're interested in battles? Like, if they can narrow that down, that's going to help them um, when they start to do some researching. Um, and you'll see that the library has, you know, some good guides that can be very helpful. Um, for example, here we have an exhibit. I love the Library of Congress exhibits. I think that they can be of a great benefit to students. And again, especially if you have students who are doing, uh, you know, either web pages or exhibits for History Day, because it gives them a sense of kind of how to contextualize sources within an exhibit and bring in interpretation. Um, so I'm not saying that you're going to create, uh, you know, professional level exhibits, but it gives them an example of what an exhibit should look like. Um, and so here, you know, you'll see you have the sections. Um, so this one is broken down chronologically. Um, and so we see here, you know, we've got some sources. We have some good contextual information for those sources. So again, these can be really, really beneficial, um, both for students. They can also be a great learning source for you. Um, so again, I really encourage you guys to take a look at the Library of Congress exhibits, um, as I think that they are uh, really valuable. And one of the great things is that anytime the library develops a new exhibit, they create an online piece that lives on past the time of that uh, actual physical exhibit um, there um, in DC. So another thing, let's see, let me see if I can. That's the best way to get to a good example of this. So text sources. Um, you know, the Library of Congress has some great paper collections. Um, one thing that you want to remind students of, um, though, is that not all of their paper collections are uh, transcribed. So what you want to look for um, when you are looking at any of the paper collections is to see if they have a PDF available of a document once you get to it. So for example, this one right here, uh, this is where sometimes I hate how Zoom is trying to move stuff where I can actually get to all the things. So we see we can see the single view of just this page. Uh, if we get down to this side, uh, we see we have some JPEGs available, but we don't have a PDF file. And really, a PDF file is what you want to look for. Um, so I do not see one for this one. So it doesn't look like that we have a transcription available for this one. But let's... Yeah, so no PDF, no transcription. So that means that if students wanted to look at this, you know, one of these documents, they would either transcribe it themselves or maybe this is where Google search can come in handy. Some documents you can search in the title if there is a full title for the document itself and maybe some other site somewhere has transcribed it. Um, let me see if I can find us an example of one real quickly that does have a transcription. Kira, if you click on the download as PDF, I'm just wondering, does that have a transcription on it or not? Or is that just the image of the piece. I think it's just the image. Oh, okay. I can't believe that they chose non-transcribed things for their... Yeah, I know. I was thinking for sure that this one would have been... Like... Although that's pretty neat handwriting, I suppose. Uh, yeah, if, if, if you have some students who are into that kind of thing, but I'm sure you have a lot of other students that are going to be turned off by it. Yeah, I mean, you would have... Uh, all right. Lincoln is one that tends to be... Oh, so here we Yay. go. All right, so... Lincoln Papers. So here with this one, we see, you know, it actually lists here that there is a transcript available in PDF, or you can download the PDF here. Um, and what that is going to do, again, is going to give you a transcript of this document. So again, when you're looking at text sources, that's what you want to look for 
and you see there we have that, including some, some footnotes there that they've included. Um, when you're getting to longer documents, like you're going to run across some things that are transcribed in these PDFs that are, you know, 10, 20, 30, 150 pages or more. Um, and that is where teaching students the value of control F and a keyword search is super valuable. Um, so that is something, again, to keep in mind. Text sources are super great in the Library of Congress. You just need to be mindful of how to look for transcriptions and know that not all of them will have those transcriptions. So, books are the other things that I wanted to mention. Um, so I'm trying to think of a few things that, you know, sometimes we, we overlook. Uh, so let's go back here and we'll just use Civil War again as our Or sample. Um, the library has a number um, of, and these are usually older books, you know, um, that are available electronically. And, you know, I'm not saying that these are going to be the easiest things for students to use, but we have found over the years, sometimes you can find some great uh, material in some of these digitized books. Um, Stacey, wasn't there an activity you did just recently where you pulled out some stuff out of one of these books? We did for a webinar not too long ago. One of the books from archive.org? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. The, um, in the Native American Resistance and Removal uh, newsletter, uh, I found a book that had verbatim copied a lot of primary sources that weren't otherwise available individually. And I plucked those out and put them into a student packet about the Potawatomi Trail of Death. So they can be so, very useful. Yeah, so uh, they can be very useful and right now the library's website uh, is not cooperating with this. All right, so <laughs> another valuable tool, sometimes when you get that where it's temporarily not working, hit refresh a couple times and it will fix that problem for you. So what you want to look for if you were looking for in a book, uh, so let's find us an example. And of course, this will be the day that it wants to be super slow. There's just too much Civil War stuff that's yeah. not a book. There's a book right there. Oh, that's 1999. Never mind. No, I'm use that. So you want to look for one that will sort of be like this. It'll say catalog record and electronic resource available, but you want it to be a book. This is a map. Um, and so what that will do then, that means that I have it usually through archive.gov where you can access that full book. Um, so since it's not cooperating with us very well. Well, one of the thing, one of the sources I'm going to bring up tomorrow is going to be from one of the, that kind of books from archive.org from 1909. Uh, so if you're going to be tuning in tomorrow, you'll get a, an, illustration of what Kira's talking about. So one of the other collections, and uh, Nikki, I believe they, the National History Day still has a special award for best use of Chronicle America. Is that correct? Do you remember they did that this year? I know they used to. Yeah, but what Chronicle America is, is a collection of historic newspapers. Um, and this uh, is a great tool for students to use. Um, you see, you know, basic search functions, advanced search functions, um, and then, of course, you can access kind of all of the papers that are digitized. Um, when you are doing a search, um, it will actually highlight in red on the page uh, what your, where your search terms are, so it makes it a little easier to do, um, you know, you don't have to scan the whole page to figure it out. Um, we also are big fans of the recommended topics section. Um, and so, for example, here, we'll do the 1900 election. What we really like about these is it gives you a listing of selected topics. So, for example, here's one of the selected um, articles here, and we see, again, all kinds of things on this particular page about the 1900 election. So you can scroll in then and, um, you know, be able to read that page. 
And again, these can be really great for History Day projects because, you know, it gives you a chance to really kind of dive into these collections and find out what people in, you know, in different communities were feeling about events that were happening. Um, there are quite a few Tennessee papers that are digitized in this collection. Um, and so again, I really encourage you to, you know, introduce your, this to your students. Um, it can be a fabulous resource for um, any of their History Day projects. All right, and the last thing that I wanted to bring up from the Library of Congress um, is the research guides. Let me do. So for a number of kind of key people, you know, especially presidents, um, you know, legislation, those kind of things, there are what they call their research guides. Um, and these research guides are a fabulous way to get uh, a selection of primary sources related to that particular item. It will, all right, so here is one. And you'll see, usually if you're doing a search, if there's one of these, it'll pop up really towards the top of a search results list. And if you see one, again, definitely you want to dive into it and see what you can find. So again, you know, you'll start off with an introduction. And so you see here, it's actually going to link us to the Indian Removal Act, where it lives in the Century of Lawmaking Collection. And if you're looking at topics from kind of the early part of U.S. history, um, a lot of things are going to pop up from that Century of Lawmaking. Uh, it's a collection with a lot of valuable materials. It's not easy to search. Um, and so that's where I find these research guides to be particularly helpful because it can help you to find things in those, that collection, particularly that would be difficult to find um, otherwise. Um, and so you'll see here, we've got three suggested sources here, but if we click on digital collections over here on the left, um, we see a number of uh, links to when it was being debated in the Senate uh, and in the House of Representatives. Uh, and again, these are all Century of Lawmaking uh, pieces. Uh, we have a link to when uh, Jackson um, outlined this policy in his second message to second annual message to Congress. Um, so we have that access. Uh, we have you know Indian land sessions, uh, the correspondence on the immigration of Indians, and so this is going to be one of those big volumes. Again, not easy to search, but there is some really great stuff in here. So if you have some time. Um, is definitely worth looking at. And then, you know, here we have the Jackson Papers, and here are some particular uh, sources that they have highlighted. Historic newspapers, again, we get some, you know, some suggested articles. Maps, we get the Van Buren Papers, and then uh, in printed ephemera, um, here are some other suggested sources. And then you'll see that beyond that, then they link you to things from exhibits, from America's Library, from the teacher's page, from Today in History. So again, just a wealth of information that you can find through these research guides. Uh, and including, you get some uh, external websites, and so this is uh, some other places that you might go to find related information. So again, if you find a research guide for a topic that you were looking for, um, definitely take some time to dig into it, because it um, can just be a wealth of information. They have really become one of my favorite go-to's when I'm using the Library of Congress site. All right, questions. Any questions about using the Library of Congress website um, for research? Well, keep in mind that as you are um, you know, preparing for this next school year. If you are looking for uh, sources related to a particular topic, um, you may be struggling to find um, something that uh, we are happy to assist. Um, so you can find our contact information um, on our website, uh, which is mtsu.edu slash TPS. Um, and Stacy and I are happy to take our, you know, collectively we're at like 20 plus years of experience digging through this website. We are happy to put that to use for you. Um, and we can usually pretty quickly kind of tell you, can direct you in the, the right direction for things. Um, so definitely kind of keep that in mind.